All right, we're ready to go. Welcome everybody. Um, so I'm John Muir Laws. Um, I got, let me give you a little bit of background about myself. I got started nature journaling when I was about maybe six or seven years old. Um, my parents were avid naturalists and we'd spend a lot of time tromping around in the woods. And on one of our, our family field trips, uh, we were out botanizing with some of my mom's friends. And there was a woman there who had a notebook and some pens and pencils. And she was walking around in the fields and drawing wildflowers. And my mom looked over and she noticed that her son was just, was that woman's shadow for the entire day. I, wherever she would walk, I would just walk along next to her and she would sit down and I'd sit down in the grass and watch what she did, watch her, her hands drawing the, the whatever wildflower it was. And then we'd go on to the next, and she'd plop down again and I'd plop down right next to her, sat down next to her during lunch. So the, the, the next time that we went out into the field on a family adventure, mom said, you know, honey, I got something for you here. Take a look in the back of the car. And I went back there and it was exactly the same kind of notebook, exactly the same pencils and, and pens that that, uh, that that woman, Neela Watley, had been using. And um, I knew just what to do with them and I've been kind of going ever since. And for me, it was a um, uh, just an incredibly important part of the way that I was processing the world. Um, I'm dyslexic. And so writing was challenging for me. I was really intimidated by a lot of the, by the, uh, having to write, uh, write words. Um, I thought if I write words, they're going to come back covered in red pen. And so, but drawing was a place for me that was safe from the red pen. And so I would fill these notebooks up with my nature observations, all with drawings and drawings and drawings and drawings. Um, as I developed as a naturalist, I began to see that just drawing was a real limitation. There are, drawing is a very, very useful language for taking what you see and documenting it. And it also helps you pay closer attention um, while you're there, when you're in front of the flower or the, the, the squirrel, whatever it is that's in front of you, as you are drawing that, it, th that process forces you to look again and look again and look again, even at the things that you think you know, and you start to see things through new eyes. But drawing is, although it's a very powerful tool, um, sometimes, you know, like you're, let's say you're, you're drawing a leaf and it's covered with these fine, white, fuzzy hairs. And how do you draw that? The more hairs you draw in, the darker your leaf becomes with your graphite pencil. It's really, really hard to do. Well, it turns out if you draw your leaf and you draw a little line to it and you say covered with fine little white hairs, ooh, you just, you just solved that problem. And also I found the minute you start drawing, you have a, uh, you're drawing and you start to write around it and draw little lines in kind of annotating it, all of that kind of capital A art pressure, I've got to make a pretty picture, just lifts off your shoulders. Your brain goes like, oh, you're not trying to make a pretty picture. What you're doing here is observing and documenting and relating to the world. I get it. So the picture is a tool towards that. And that's the way I really recommend that people think about this. You don't want to think of your journal as a portfolio of pretty pictures in nature. If you do that, what's going to happen is your brain is going to shut down because lots of us were not, you know, drawing isn't our comfort zone. And even if it is, then you'll be looking at some plant and you go, you'll sometimes say like, I don't even know where I would begin with that. Forget it. I'm not going to journal about that. Um, and if you hold it in your head as this kind of art portfolio, it makes it much less likely that you'll use it and it makes the way that you use it much less useful. So the way that I think about the purpose of a journal, I'm gonna bring out my assistant here. This is your brain. This is your brain on paper, right? So anything that you notice, anything that you are 
thinking about, wondering about anything that's going on in here, it turns out that the human brain, as wonderful as this chunk of electric meat is, is really, really limited in what it can do just on its own. It has a bandwidth. Um, so the, the research shows that you know, the reason that talking on your phone while driving a car is dangerous is not because you may have something in your hand. So that's, it turns out that the people who are doing hands-free are just as much of a hazard as, as the people who actually have the device in their hand and they're talking. What it is, is our mental bandwidth is not big enough to handle the task of driving this vehicle and all of the reactions that you need to make and engaging in a conversation. That's why you can't have two conversations going on at the same time. If you're trying to talk to somebody and eavesdrop on somebody else at the same time, your brain can't handle it, right? So you actually have to stop talking and listen, right? And um, so that's, you know, you see the same thing in your classrooms. If kids are multitasking, if they're doing something, you know, with a little tablet or whatever, they're not going to have the bandwidth to do whatever kind of higher order functions you're, you're working at. And the same is true when we're out in nature is if you are, um, you're, you're looking at something, you're trying to remember stuff and you're trying to think about it, your brain is going to start to take shortcuts. Your brain has all sorts of hacks that it uses so that it doesn't have to use as much as much of your sort of of your of your resources in order to think about whatever you're doing. Um, so this is your brain is two percent of your body weight, two percent of your total body weight. But this chunk of electric meat uses get this twenty percent. 20% of all the calories that you ingest. So that's one out of every five burritos goes to feed your brain. And so it's this incredibly demanding um, thing. And if your brain can find an easier way to kind of get through a thinking situation, your brain will do that behind the scenes without your knowing it. So I'll just give you a few examples of this. Um, sort of one of the more interesting ones is um, what's called these sort of rumination loops. And if you put a helmet on somebody that tracks their eyeball motion and you put them in front of a beautiful painting by one of the masters and you say, I want you to really study this and you track their eyeball motions, what the person first does, they kind of look around the painting and then their eyes will focus on one detail, maybe that face over there, then go to the hand holding the cup then go to this high contrast point in the painting and then they go back to that face and then over to the cup and then to the high contrast point and face and cup and high and they, they get in this loop of I'm noticing these different things and what's happening is your brain is quickly going all right for my survival nothing essential here we're cool all right what are we going to do we're going to now get into this comfortable loop where I'm just going back to familiar landmarks and we do this in all sorts of situations. Um, we do the same thing um, when we're thinking about situations. If you're just sort of sitting down and you're trying to, to problem solve something and you're doing it all up here, a lot of what happens is your brain is just spinning around with the same idea. You've probably seen somebody kind of getting over a breakup and they're sitting on their couch feeling sorry for themselves. Maybe it's been you. Um, and, and, and you're just replaying the same scene again and again and again. And it's not until your best friend comes over and makes a pot of tea and sits down with you and you start to talk it out that you, and you get through that story that you can then go on to the next thing and go on to the next thing. Um, and what's happening there is you are, it's called externalizing your thinking. The reason that talk therapy helps is it gets you out of here and it gets these ideas into the conversation space between you and your therapist. Right, so here's your nature therapist. What you do is you make an observation and you put it in here. You make an observation, you put it in here. And what that does is it frees up mental resources to make the next great observation and the next thing after that and the next thing after that. And it helps you hang on to the things that you have already done. Think about making, you're, gonna, um, you're making a list at home of all the things the next time you go to the grocery store, um, which may be in a week. Um, you are all the things you're going to bring. If you tried to keep that all in your head, you would not have the mental bandwidth for anything else. 
And the other cool thing is that it works. You make that list and then when you're at the store, you get everything on it. So this journal works the same way. You make observations, those are stored in long-term memory, but it's freeing up your, your, your cognitive resources, your mental bandwidth to be able to, uh, to do other tasks. And so you will think better if you start journaling. You will become a better naturalist if you start journaling. Um, you actually will become more socially, emotionally intelligent if you start journaling and include some of your kind of personal feelings and things. So there's research that shows that people who keep a diary are more social, emotionally intelligent than the rest of us who, who, who don't. I actually don't keep a diary, so I'm one of those people who's just, you know, I keep making my mistake again and again and again and again. And, um, but, um, but because I'm, I'm, I'm documenting my nature observations, I, I am growing this way. So get it out of your head, get it onto the page, and your brain will think better. Every prominent naturalist or scientist that any of you can name, I guarantee you that individual kept notebooks and journals. Everyone, right? And the reason that, um, and people say, isn't it like, it's so wonderful that Da Vinci was this super smart scientist and happened to keep notebooks. And we, down the line, we can look through these notebooks and we can kind of get into Da Vinci's head and see what Da Vinci was thinking. Uh-uh-uh, that's backwards. What it is, is that Da Vinci was Da Vinci because Da Vinci was keeping those notebooks. Da Vinci would not have been Da Vinci without keeping those notebooks. And the same is true for Marie Curie. Um, the same is true for whoever it is that when I said some prominent scientist, whoever that person is that came to your mind, they kept notebooks, they kept journals because our brains work better when they do. Um, one of the big barriers to entry on this is that for a lot of us, if we think of it as a place where I want to make a lot of pictures and draw pretty pictures and it, um, I, I don't know if we can kind of do this polling thing, but I'm kind of curious. Um, I'm going to switch over to kind of group view here. I can see some of you. Um, raise your paw if drawing and sketching is not really in your comfort zone. Okay. So a few of us out there, and then we've got everybody else's screens turned off. So I don't know about those people. Um, but, oh, yep. Yeah, so Lynn says, yeah, that's, that's me too. Um, so here is, here's, here's the, de the deal. Um, this journaling is not about making pretty pictures. It is not about um, making a pretty presentation thing to show other people. It is your brain downloaded onto paper. It's your brain, it's a way of sharing what is in your, your head um, with yourself onto paper. So the purpose of it is not the page, it's to help us think more richly. And bless you. Um, so if you start thinking of it as a pretty portfolio piece, it is going to shut you down, right? It's gonna be hard to put stuff down onto paper. On the other hand, if you think of it as, a, as, as sort of like a, a naturalist journal, then it's going to open doors that you cannot possibly imagine right now. Um, and just remember, like every naturalist that you can name or think of, every scientist, they all kept journals. Um, and the ones who didn't really didn't contribute anything to science and natural history. And we've forgotten who they are. Um, so here's, here's the formula for how you do this. Um, you folks, um, I, I, you have been uh, exploring the idea of, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, have people been, ex you've been exposed to that? Yep, I'm seeing some heads nodding. Yes, I'm seeing some, some, some thumbs up. Yes, okay. So, so that for me is, um, that is my, that's the naturalist mantra. Is I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. So you're putting your observations, like I noticed this. I've got my questions, right? And I also have my connections, right? I, I, I want to um, you see, you know, how... How does this thought relate to, to other ones? You want to get yourself to start to be kind of a networker of ideas in your heads. 
in your head. And if you do this out loud in conversation with other people, that's useful. That's, that's better than trying to do it in your head. But the minute you get it out onto paper, it starts to bounce back to you in a different way because you can actually look down and see what you are thinking. You also have a permanent record of your observations and your thoughts at different times. Turns out that human memory is absolutely terrible. Um, our memory is a, a creative constructive process. When you're remembering things, you're taking some events from the past and, and, but your brain doesn't remember all the details. But you know, when you remember something, you remember a scene, you remember something happening. What your brain is actually doing is taking these little shards of an experience that have gotten locked onto some neurons, and it is seamlessly splicing those together with completely made up stuff to present back to you a visual compelling image of what happened. And your brain cannot tell the difference between the facts of what happened and what's called the confabulation, the stuff that your brain made up. And so over time, our memories drift and change. Um, I, I recently had the embarrassing thing of telling somebody else this interesting story of something that happened to me. And they said, um, excuse me, but that actually happened to me. And I told you that story a long time ago. Is this, am I, is it, you, you too, D? Yeah, and, and Jenny, you, you, you've had this experience too. Isn't that weird? And it's like, no, 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 no. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And so one of us, one of us must be wrong. But, but the weird thing is, that's the way our memories work. We take all sorts of stuff, we stitch it together, and it comes back to us as if, as if this is the way that it was. And we can't tell the difference. We can't tell the difference. But the minute you get something down on paper here, even if you do it upside down, let's try this. Now, the minute you get something down on paper, um, you now have an anchor for those memories. You have an anchor for these experiences. And this becomes a useful document for you to either record, um, sort of think about the, the fabric of your own life and your own experiences, or the sort of scientific <clears throat> discoveries that, that you've made. Um, so get it out of your head, get it onto paper. The, 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 so if you're doing a notice I wonder it reminds me of, and you're doing it all in here, you're deep in rumination loop land, and you're not gonna be getting as much out of it. If you're out by yourself in the middle of the forest and you're talking out loud, that process will be a little bit better because you are now hearing yourself say these things, it makes things stick in your head a little bit more. Turns out that I noticed, I wonder, it reminds me of if we, if we just do it silently in our head, it's not quite as effective. Um, but there's a very powerful boost that you can get by, by verbalizing everything that you're seeing. So when I'm out in the woods by myself, I'm talking to the trees and the flowers and sort of having this kind of ongoing discussion with them about all the way which we're interacting with each other. It's much better if you're actually interacting with other people because then you're getting all the advantages of their stuff bouncing off of you. And um, even more powerful is documenting all that sort of stuff into your journal. And um, this is going to force you to observe deeper. And it also gives you this memory anchor later on. Um, incredibly powerful. So there are three languages that I'm going to suggest that you use in your journal. Um, and one is just words. Right? So, and it's good. Sometimes when I'm doing this, it's coming out as mirror writing on some of these Zoom things, but it looks like we don't have the problem with mirror writing in this Zoom presentation. All right, so words, those are, that's, that's a big deal. Um, Use words, use writing all over your page. Also use pictures all right? Words and pictures. It's not that one of these is better than the other, although research has shown that drawing a picture, even if it's not a pretty picture, is a more powerful memory anchor than words. Um, so this is better 
and it's not about having a pretty picture. It's a better memory anchor. Um, and so that's, that's why it's really a very important reasons why it's, why it's useful to us. So using words and pictures, and the last thing here is to start to use numbers. Um, we want to start to quantify as much as we can. When you're counting things, measuring things, timing things, estimating things, your brain is thinking in a very different way than it is when you are drawing a picture. And it's not that one is better than the other, it's that they are fundamentally different thinking processes. And the more that you intentionally make yourself go there when you're out in the field, the more powerful this is going to be, the better that this is gonna work for you. So we've got words, we have pictures and numbers. You're putting those onto the page. Um, this is the way we record our I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. So it's I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of done on a page with words, pictures, and numbers. And that's sort of fundamentally what nature journaling is, is about. Um, anytime you get kind of wrapped around the axle about that doesn't look good enough, start writing written notes on the sides. Go for a page that's dense with data, dense with information, rather than um, something that, that and once you do that, your brain goes like, oh yeah, we're being naturalists, cool. We're, and, and, and you hop back into it. Um, that's much more effective than trying to make yourself sort of make pretty picture art. But the, here's the, the fun thing though, if you let go of this idea of I have to make pretty pictures, it's gonna free you up to make a lot of pictures, right? And because if you can just make like, like, like I, there's an octopus with a million little legs, but this doodle will help me understand the shape of the sucker. And this is gonna help me understand where the siphon came out. And that doesn't look like all those legs wrapping around together and how do I foreshorten those things? But I'm not worried about that because I actually recorded some information with this little icon. That's helpful. You just have been drawing. You're training yourself. You're training this to respond to what comes in your eye and makes your hand move. The more that you do that loop in the eye, through the brain, out to your hand, the more that pathway gets reinforced. Your brain changes its shape, fundamentally changes its shape based on what you do. The parts of your brain that you use for an exercise, if it is difficult for you to do, a little bit of a challenge, and you keep doing that, your brain changes its shape in response to that stimulus. So for neuroplasticity, for neurodevelopment, the signal your brain needs is repetition with effort. Repetition with effort. So if you start to, like you say, well, drawing's not, I'm not an artist, I'm not a drawer, I, that's, that's hard for me. It's not in my strike zone, that's gonna be okay. So what, you, what you're gonna do though, is you're just gonna start using drawings though, um, without pressure to start to record what you see. And the more that you do that, the more you're gonna reinforce those pathways. What happens is your brain eventually says, look, you keep doing this thing. It's hard for me to do. Please stop it, right? But you keep doing it. And, you, and so then what your brain does to make it easier for your brain is those parts of your brain, the little neural paths that it has to take to do that activity, it is going to stitch together more neurons in that area. Those parts of the brain get denser and larger in response to the work that you do. And this happens at all ages. So this isn't just something that happens in young developing brains. We used to think that your brain kind of grew in up until some point in adolescence and then it stopped and that's the brain that you have. And, and then you're going to go forth with that brain. So you might as well, you know, do an IQ test, find out how good your brain is, and then you can figure out what you want to do with that. But now we know that's totally baloney. That's not the way that brains develop. They develop through your entire life based on what you challenge your brain to do. So if you've got a good limber brain and you retire to the land of surfing YouTube and your brain doesn't have to work anymore, your brain is going to start to prune branches off your neural tree, right? But if you are pushing some new direction, your brain grows bigger at all ages, right? And there's a huge body of, of research behind this. 
you can see fMRIs of of they'll they'll have people learn a skill and you can watch the part of the brain that does that just go whoop, right bigger denser we change our brain you change your brain so what's going to happen is at the start of if, if you start right now and you say i cannot draw a straight line but you start drawing regularly in your journal without pressure because you're thinking naturalist at the end of this one year your friends are going to come up to you and say oh gosh you're so lucky to have that gift but you know me i'm not a drawer i wasn't born like you with the drawing gene right um it's it's a skill that you developed though um and it will continue to get better throughout your entire life so um it once you develop that facility with it what you do is you just push your boundary a little bit more you want to kind of keep surfing on the edge where you're just a little bit outside of your comfort zone with whatever skill you're developing right whether that's observation plant identification um, keying things out, drawing pictures, asking questions, all of these sort of essential naturalist skills. Right? That's, that's what's going to make the difference. So you don't have to start off an, as an artist, um, but art is a tool you're going to be using. And at the end of the day, you will actually end up as one. But if you make that the goal, the whole thing collapses because then you go like, oh no, that doesn't look pretty. Ah, I, don't, I can't do this. I, I can't, I can't do it. As, especially as, as, as adults, especially actually in our society, especially male adults, they identify themselves by their core competencies and they're not willing to go out on a limb and be in that vulnerable place where you're not let, uh, yet an expert. And so we say, I can't learn new skills. I can't. I can't take that up. It's a threat to you not being an expert. And so um, don't identify yourself by what your skills are. Identify yourself by your willingness to be in a learning process in everything that you do. And that will keep getting you better at the things that you're already good at and will give you permission to to start things, to start new things. And you want to keep your brain crispy? This is, that's, that's, that's the secret for it. So I think that nature journaling, the number one tool of a naturalist. Doesn't matter if you bring your binoculars with you when you go for a hike. Doesn't matter if you bring your, 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 your hand lens with you. You forgot those things at home, that's a bummer. You forgot your journal, there's a big part of your thinking that you're not gonna actually be able to do because um, we do our best, uh, the, 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 in the, the research literature, they call it externalizing your thinking. You have to get it out of here and, and into some place where it can bounce back to you. And that makes all the difference. Um, so let's uh, pause for a minute here. So that, that's, that's big picture what um, I, actually, let, let me add one more piece to the big picture. Just kind of going back to my words, pictures, and numbers here, and thinking about practicing this. Um, in each one of these three, there are specific skills that you can hone and develop and improve on. And so rather than go like, I have to do all this, what I like to do is just take a little piece of one of these and develop it. So for instance, um, with words, you can do all sorts of interesting things, things with words. Um, so with, with, where's that, there's that pen. So um, if you are writing along in paragraphs, right, that's a useful, that's a good thing to do. Um, but if you start to make bullet point lists, that's going to take your brain in a totally different direction. It's not that this is better than the other. They're different. Similarly, if I start making labels, and here's another label, and I'm adding those all over my notes, connecting things, um, kind of adding a meta level of thinking about something, maybe adding details to drawings with words. 
That kind of thing, so the kind of thinking you're doing when you're using words as labels is different than bullet points, is different than paragraphs, and that's different than if I kind of sit back and I look at this whole thing, all the things I've been thinking about, and I come up with, like, what is the big idea of what I've been looking about here, and I make a title. And this time I get to do it in big block letters. Um, so you might be thinking to yourself, well, this title, um, here, that's, that's more of an aesthetic thing, but actually it's not. What it is, is you're getting your brain to kind of at a meta level, think about what is the big picture of what you're looking at and gets you to back up away from what you're doing. You can even put in a subtitle here, right? And what you're doing is then kind of thinking, sort of imposing a structure on, I've been out here looking, and what I've really been looking at is change in the creek. That's my theme for the day, and I write change in the creek across the top. That helps all these ideas kind of wrap into my head in a different way. Do you see how all these are just different ways of playing with words? Right? The same is true with, with pictures. Um, what a lot of us do, what, what you think we're supposed to do, is you're supposed to walk up to the flower and um, I'm going to draw a portrait of the flower, kind of like a country diary for an Edwardian lady. Um, here's my portrait of my flower, and then I write the scientific name underneath it, and then I go to my next page. Um, yeah, you could do a portrait of something, but there's tons of other stuff that you could do. So, for instance, so I'm, I'm going to now just sort of flesh out your kind of your a little bit of your toolkit of what you can do with pictures. Um, this has a serrated, a finely serrated leaf edge. I'm gonna take that part and I'm gonna blow it up. And that is what I'm seeing there. So I can zoom in and zoom out on this thing. Um, I can, um, here's the little hillside and me standing on it um, below the oak tree. And these are growing sort of just in the drip line of that oak tree. So what I've just done is I've zoomed away. I've zoomed in, I've zoomed out. I'm gonna notice different sorts of things at a little diagram at this level. So I can do cross sections of a valley. Here's where these different types of trees are growing down by the creek. I've got this other kind, right? All right. I can do cross sections. I can make maps. All right. I can zoom in. I can zoom out. Um, I can um, use these pictures in lots of. I, I can find. Um, let, let's say that that I, I, I'm in here and I see that there are little gopher holes coming down. Um, I could draw those gopher holes on here. I could also. Um, I'm going to draw a big arrow down here to this part here where I'm going to start to record the structure of these gopher holes. They have a, a little plug at one side and a mound. I'm going to draw a cross section from A to B across here and from A to B here. They start off with a little plug and then they kind of have a mound that comes up around that. And I'm going to add in some writing about that, maybe some labels pointing to different parts, right? Um, so you see how it's kind of getting me out of the zone of I'm making a portrait of this one plant. You can record information about phenomena, um, about anything that you see. And the more tools that are in your quiver of how to record stuff visually, the better off you are. So just as you can have a lot of strategies for handling words, the same is true with pictures. And the last piece is the numbers. So uh, with numbers, um, what we want to do is get ourselves out of the zone of saying um, there, the hillside was covered with countless wildflowers. All right? Because that can mean a whole bunch of different things. You know, when we look back and we see the, the fields were covered with, with countless bison. Um, and you now go to um, the National Bif Bison Refuge and you see a whole bunch of bison. Somebody today will go like, wow, the hills were covered with countless bison. 
but we're talking about things that are orders of magnitude different, right? So um, when you can count, count things, right? Um, if you have a watch, you can time things. The duck dives, how many seconds till it comes up again? Um, you can measure things. Put a measuring tape in your kit and start to add those in on your page. Um, I want to show you a really fun trick that I don't know why I was never taught this in schools. I found um, some teachers, there's a, a fifth grade teacher who I, I know who always teaches this to her class. Um, but for some reason, it just hasn't made it into kind of our, our sort of common way of, of looking at numbers. Um, let's say, you know, you know how, if, let's say you're looking at Yarrow wildflowers and you measure those in centimeters. Um, and you measure one and then you measure another, you're going to get different measurements, right? Because they're different heights. So what we might do is you might start making a table. This one, the first one was 32 centimeters, centimeters, oh, I'm gonna put centimeters at the top, all right? The 32, the next was, was 19, the next one was 14, the next one was 27. You can make this little table of these measurements, but for me at least, this just starts to feel like number soup and I start thinking like, why am I doing this? This isn't really teaching me that much about the yarrow. I'm getting a bunch of numbers and maybe numbers are good and so that's, that's satisfying. But for me, this isn't really, it isn't really that satisfying. So here's, here's what I, here's, here's the trick. And again, why this isn't taught more places this is for us as naturalists. This, um, how many people took a statistics class years and years and years and years, and years ago? Where at some point, somebody taught you how to calculate the mean and the standard deviation, and we have since forgotten that, right? But we kind of remember that the mean was kind of the middle, and the standard deviation was some sort of measure of the spread. So you want to kind of, in statistics, there's all these ways of kind of calculating the central tendency of data um, using uh, in some cases, the mean, the median, um, all these other sort of measures of the middle of data, and the central and and the and the and the spread of that data. So standard deviation of it kind of give you an idea of like is this really kind of clumped here? What is the shape of that data? I think that in our schooling, um, one of the big problems we have with the way which we teach math in our schools. We spend a lot of time doing um, high level calculus in high school, but we really don't do anything with statistics. So statistics, statistics ends up being this incredibly useful thing that, um, and so don't worry, I'm not gonna show you how to calculate the mean and the standard deviation, but just check out how powerful this, this next thinking tool is. You're back there in that field with the yarrow. And I'm gonna have a vertical line here, all right? And the first one that I measure, it's going to be 37 centimeters. And the next one I measure is 34 centimeters. What I'm gonna do is this is my 30 row. I'm gonna put my four here, all right? The next one is 23 five centimeters. So I'm gonna put my 25 here. And then I get one that is 48 centimeters. I get one that is 52 centimeters. I get one that is 32 centimeters. I get one that is 45 centimeters. I get one that is 45 centimeters again. All right, I get one that is 73 centimeters. I get one that is 21 centimeters, All right? You see what I'm doing? If I turn this this way, I have just drawn a picture of my data, All right? So you can look at this and get a sense of the central tendency and the spread of data that you collect real time in the field and you actually get your data analysis spitting back out at you on your journal page. And because you're gonna find some things you'll start to measure them and what's gonna happen is patterns will emerge to you. 
is it this? All right? It may be. Um, but what is going on when you find this? Ooh, there's something going on here. What's, what's happening with this? I don't know yet, but this is the sort of stuff that the numbers are going to start to prompt your questions. Or maybe it kind of goes up steep on this side and has a big tail out that way. Why is it that shape? Right? So the numbers will start to draw their own picture. And you'll be like, oh, snap, there is something going on here. And you're able to see that real time when you are out there in the field. And it's really fun. So that's just an, one example of how you can use numbers. So I notice, I wonder what it reminds me of on paper, words, pictures, numbers. That's the formula. That's the formula. Don't get hung up around having to write like Mary Oliver. Don't get hung up on having to draw like Robert Bateman. But use words. Use pictures, right? Um, don't get hung up on having to um, do, um, be able to, you have to, 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 to calculate the, the, the standard deviation of something. But start to use numbers, start to measure things, start to estimate, like how many ducks is that, right? And if I can't be precise, maybe it's between this and this. Here's another good tr accounting trick. Instead of going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, you can do that for a small number, but if it's a larger number of things, first just get out there and look at all the ducks and go like, wow, there's a lot of ducks here. And don't write down in your journal, there's a lot of ducks. No, 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 no. Say to yourself, I think I'm looking at about 75 ducks. I think this is 75 ducks, all right? So you'll first know what your brain kind of immediately came up with. And then group count them. Go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's ten. And physically hold your hand out there as you're looking at the ducks. That's ten, right? There's ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty. Those ones are spread out, but there's sort of sixty, sixty. Yeah, about sixty ducks. So when I group count it, I got sixty ducks. And that helps me know that my initial count, I'm when I'm looking at groups of ducks, I'm kind of airing a little bit too high. And then if you're able to just sit there and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And then you can find out exactly um, how precise and accurate you're being. And the more you do this, the better you're going to, to get at estimating numbers. And you can do this with all sorts of things. You go like, wow, there's a big line in front of the supermarket. How many people are there, right? I'm going to guess there are 100, 150 people, right? Then, then, okay, that's 10, 10, 20, count, group count those, and then you're gonna be in that line for a long time. So you'll have time to go one person, two person, three person, four person, and then you're going to, over time, get a better intuitive sense of playing with numbers. So a numeracy is this really interesting thing. We all know what three looks like. Immediately, we have got three. But the minute I say 75 ducks, all of us are getting different pictures in our heads. When I say 2,000 ducks, we all get this idea of there's a lot of ducks, right? But if I said, how does a field with 2,000 ducks look different than a field with 3,000 ducks in it? Right? You can imagine something one third bigger, but what are you really looking at in terms of ducks? Could you roll up on a field and say, that looks like a 2,000 field, uh, 2,000 ducks out there? You can't. But the more you start doing this, you can also group count by 100. So we have 10, 20, 30, 40, okay, there's 100. 100, 200 ducks, 300 ducks, 400 ducks. You'll get better at this essential naturalist skill of finding the numbers around you. And then you're just, you're putting it all in here, right? This, again, is your brain on paper. Words, pictures, numbers, all dancing together. And you've got your, your observations. You've got your questions. You're finding mysteries around you. You're making connections. And you're, you're training yourself also as you're doing this to be a visual thinker. And that, that ends up being also a really useful, powerful skill. Um, if you can think in pictures and communicate in pictures, 
you have a very, you've developed a very rare and a very useful skill. Most people in Western society are visually illiterate. Um, because art's been taken out of our schools and it's been sort of sidelined as this thing that's non-essential. You got to learn writing, you got to learn uh, math. And, and those are the things we're going to test you on, so you better learn those. But um, I've been at a bunch of meetings where everybody was talking about ideas and nobody could really get, wrap their head around it. And then there's this kind of one person sort of sitting in the, quietly in the corner until finally she reaches out and she pulls this napkin across the table and she goes, well, I kind of, I kind of see it, this is our, our, our situation. What we're really looking at is that our system has, it's got these, these three components. Um, these ones here, there's huge interaction between these things. So we are, we're, we're um, this, is, this is where all the action is. But all the, pro, you know, and they, whatever is going on, they make a little diagram. They take whatever issue it is and they can turn this idea into a picture. Has anybody sort of seen one of these napkin moments where there's kind of a, so give me a, a, a hand if you've ever sort of seen in a discussion where somebody can kind of take stuff and turn it into a visual and then that, what, what happens when somebody does that um, is that crystallizes the conversation going forward from there. And the deal is whoever controls the napkin controls the meeting. If you've trained yourself with visual thinking, you are the napkin person and it's your napkin. And you can use that map, napkin to communicate, to persuade, um, to clarify. Um, but if you don't have napkin skills, you are at the mercy of somebody else's napkin. So by training yourself in these skills, you're learning to, to you, you see some phenomenon going on and you say to yourself, all right, how, how, can, I, how can I communicate? How can I communicate that? All right. Um, and if you have, um, you know, so this was, I'm sorry, my, I don't know if you folks hear this, but my phone is ringing somewhere in the background. <laughs> um, so uh, this is watching an eclipse, right? Um, and um, as we go from this page, we go over to this page, we're moving through time as we kind of come up here, down into the eclipse, and then down here. Um, that's a way of, oh, and then, um, finally, the final end of the clips showing um, positions of sunspots, right? Um, that's a way of communicating stuff visually. Oh, and that's my daughter's favorite stuffed animal. That's Chuck. Um, it's Chuck because I couldn't figure out if it was a chicken or a duck. Um, Chuck, by the way, big crisis in the family has gone AWOL. For the last two weeks, no sign of Chuck in this house. We're actually posting some duck wanted posters in our house. So if you see this duck, whoops, there it is, right? Please report that to a local authority. This duck needs snuggles. And it is it's very important that we find Chuck again. Um, it's probably social distancing. That's true. That's true. Um, yeah, the question is, so cats can carry COVID. The question is, can birds? It'll be interesting to see. So th that's um, kind of a big picture about, you know, in this workshop, we're not kind of getting down into weeds of like, this is how you draw this duck, right? We're kind of looking at this from an, a higher level. And we are thinking about um, why we're doing this and the power of doing this. I've got a, on my website, a bunch of tutorials that if you want to get better at drawing or you want to get better at stem leaf plots or other quantification tools, I've got lots of specific videos with those sorts of tricks on them. Um, but I think it's really useful to kind of at a higher level kind of really get why, why we're doing this. If you personally are bought into this, like, oh, hell yes, this is, this is going to be high percentage for me, um, you're going to do it. Um, and actually, you'll start doing it. 
And then because we're all busy, what's going to happen is other things will come up and you'll put it aside. And then you'll start to feel guilt. I should be nature journaling. And you'll never touch it again because then you feel guilty about it. Or alternatively, <clears throat> what can happen is you'll start it and then you'll get really busy and you'll put it aside. And then you'll go like, oh yeah, nature journaling. That's really cool. And you're going to, um, here's, I'm granting everybody permission to stop and just to start again, right? Just if you kind of, you, you put it down and you're like, I, I, I got started on that, but then I, I wasn't following through. Don't feel bad about that. Don't feel like you're behind. Just pick it up again. Keep it out somewhere accessible and just do a little thing. Like it doesn't have to be, I got a nature journal. I got to have a couple of hours free. Um, there's a bird by your feeder. Can you take 10 minutes and just take some notes about it? And then, and then keep it out. Keep it accessible. And then... Follow that one. Then notice later on, like in that, I only drew pictures. Isn't that interesting? Huh. Wonder what's up with that. Um, I'm just going to keep an eye on, on myself. And then the next time you do that, you go like, oh, yeah, I'm going to just, I'm going to, and there were, there were 10 golden crowns and there were, um, there were five uh, white crown sparrows. I wonder how that's going to be a little bit as, as things move into the summer, um, as those golden crowns start to go north, north again. Um, so what, whatever it is, um, you, you can just start to kind of improve your game. And if you, if you slip off for a while, that's okay. Just give yourself permission just to pick it up again and continue from where you were. Don't feel bad. Don't feel like naturalist guilt. All of us are busy right now. Um, you know, I, I'm finding that, yeah, I, I can't leave the house and I'm still falling behind <laughs> with, with all the things. And also now I'm like homeschooling my kids. Um, so. See for yourself what, what, um, what you can do just to kind of keep your process going. A lot of people are finding that the online um, Facebook group called the Nature Journal Club is really helpful and really inspiring to connect with um, other people who are doing this and sort of see examples of their work. Want to invite all of you to join that if you'd like. Um, so that's, that's my thoughts on the big picture of this. Let's, let's open this up to some questions. Uh, or comments from you, or if people want to share things that you have been doing in journaling, um, we can uh, we can do that. That sound good? Sounds good. So feel free to take yourself off and ask away. <laughs> okay. So if anyone has a question. Um, I, I, I think at, at this point, we don't even have to worry about raising hands and stuff. Um, just start talking because nobody else is. Um, so, hello, my name is Lynn. Um, I, what I've been doing is uh, cheating a bit by taking my camera out, taking photos while I'm walking. Where I live, which is in Europe, um, we're only allowed to go out for an hour a day here. And we're only allowed to go for one kilometer walk. Uh, so um, I take my camera for now. But uh, you're saying in the future, when all this is over, that I should be actually taking my journal out and, uh, and drawing things or doodling things on the spot. Uh, so I haven't had the courage to do that uh, up until now. And uh, I don't have the time right now, but I, 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 I'm inspired to try it. Um, but do you, do you take your camera out, uh, um, take photos and then come back and, and work on things? Is that how you work as well? Um, no, I actually, I do go entirely from life. So these are all drawn from, from life in the field. Um, the, um, but there is no one right way to do this. Um, the one major reason I don't do the camera thing is because then I would have another thing to have to carry and I would lose it. And it's easier for me just to have my notebook, my pencil, and I'm going to put something in it. Um, and um, there's nothing wrong at all with drawing from a photograph. Um, and some people say, like, is, is it okay to draw from photograph? Is it okay to draw 
um, copying somebody else's thing? Is it okay to draw from your imagination or memory? I would say to all these things, it's not an either or thing, it's a yes and. Um, you'll find that when you draw from a photograph, <clears throat> it's a different experience than when you draw from life. And um, you'll notice different sorts of things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you will find that you will, when you're, you're drawing from life, you have the opportunity, you, you get curious about something and you go like, well, what is it like on the underside of that leaf? And you can turn the leaf over and your answer is, 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 is right there. There are things that you can do when you're live that you are unable to do um, when you are just um, working from a, um, from a photograph. But photographs okay. also make birds hold still. <laughs> They do. That's yeah. a, a really uh, nice feature. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I, I recommend people just uh, go from as many resources as you can um, and um, try not to get dependent on any one thing except um, just sort of ha at some point you want to have in your process put getting this down on paper. Um, if you are just snapping photographs of things, um, there's some interesting research on this, though. So, uh, they gave cameras to people and sent them through an art museum and said, take photographs of the things that were most moving and significant to you. And then they asked people about those things later. And they control, compared those folks with a control group who were just asked to go through a museum and look at the things that were the most moving and interesting to them. And they found that the people who had the cameras had much worse memory of what mm. they were seeing. Because mm. part of what they're doing is once the camera goes click, they get this feeling of, okay, I've got it. And your brain goes, oh, I don't have to really look at that anymore. Mm. I've got it. With as many mix, many bags of pixel, megapixels as, as my camera can, mm. can hold. I've got that. Mm. And um, so in, in research, um, there's an interesting phenomenon, parallel phenomenon, that finds that when your brain gets a feeling of task completion, it dumps resources that were used in fulfilling that task. So if you've ever studied for a test, taken the test, and then had very little recall of what you had to do after the test. If you study for the test and the test is your goal, when the, you take the test, your brain will do select all delete. And similarly, if you're looking at something going, oh my gosh, what's that, what's that, what's that, what's that? If your goal is what's that, the minute somebody says, oh, it's a Leslie Bunting, your brain will go, oh cool, what's this over here? And all this stuff gets erased mm -hmm. or, um, if you point your camera at something and you go click and it makes that satisfying click sound and you get the feeling, of, okay, now I've got it. Your brain says, oh, I actually don't have to. Your brain is just being efficient and it realizes in this moment, I don't really have to pay attention. I don't really have to think. Mm. Right? So, um, so that... In those sort of situations, taking the photograph actually impaired somebody's memory of the experience, but they did a few manipulations with this that, that are going to be uh, relevant for you. They found that you could actually improve the people's memory if instead of saying, take a picture of this, if they said, we want you to use this camera to find the angles and aspects of some object that really inspire and interest you. Show me in the photograph, what is it about it that is really moving or interesting, right? And then instead of just going, oh, cool, click, right? The people are really thinking about it and they're using the camera to engage with it in a different way. They also found that it really helps to kind of come back later and do something with those photographs to kind of go through them, pick out the good ones, you know, write the captions on them, have some sort of post-processing. Yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like you're very much doing that with yeah. those photographs that you're taking. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's gonna, that's gonna help. Um, but just be aware of the, the potential danger of your camera makes, even some of these cameras that don't have shutters in them, they'll make this very satisfying shutter click sound. And then your brain goes, I've got it. 
and then I can go on to the next thing. You want to act, you actually want to get your brain still kind of struggling with it. You want your brain in that zone where it's like, 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 but what was that about? And then it had this little thing here and kind of experience like, what is it noticing and kind of all the, the things that roll out from that. Okay, I will, when I have more time, I will take my book out and try it from life. Thank you. Yeah, and oh, absolutely. And, but, and you can also just do life drawing stuff around your home where, you know, if you see a, like, just go to the refrigerator, go on a safari in your refrigerator, pull out. <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, if there is some cottage cheese gone bad, cottage mm -hmm. cheese goes rogue, all right, um, start drawing like day one, the cottage cheese experiment, and then cover it back up, put it back in the refrigerator day two like what is it like you can you now have a pet right <laughs> um you can also do this with you can uh with, with vegetables um all sorts of stuff you can find things right around your home um so yeah. nature journaling you can practice on just on 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 vegetables right out of your refrigerator you'll find yeah. an amazing stuff just in a little stock of broccoli yeah yeah okay <laughs> excellent so uh Ginny, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. That's a really interesting question. Um, Ginny, what are you thinking today? So um, I love this idea. Um, when we taught, when I taught third grade, they had art journals that they would write, that draw, just draw in after lunch. But I taught theater in LAUSD for 17 years. And we had, we were lucky enough to have uh, one of our members who is, has her doctorate. And she worked with a neurosurgeon about synapses in the brain. So what you say is absolutely true. And I would have first graders who would do jump rope. In pantomime jump rope, there was no rope. And they would get it, we would get them better and better at the pantomime rope. And I would have first grade teachers tell me, oh my goodness, they couldn't jump rope, now they can jump rope, you know? And a lot of that is that you, what you said is the brain doesn't know the difference between the imaginary rope and a real rope. It's making the same synapses and completion so that when you go to the real thing, you're there. And I had an amazing experience happening with me with juggling. Um, I always did in pantomime juggling with my students, I mean, for years. And I thought, I wonder if this could really work. I got three balls and all of a sudden I had never been able to juggle before and there it was. It was amazing. So um, I want to believe you with the drawing because I've been trying to draw all my life, you know, so I guess it will work with that. And, and I like the feeling of um, when you were uh, saying um, with the pictures that you could go zoom in, zoom out, draw the hill, you know, draw yourself looking at the flower. What I was thinking about that is what that helps the brain do when I would teach writing, the students would have trouble flushing out paragraphs and their writing. So if they could flesh out what they're, what they're seeing in a nature journal, then I feel that they can flesh their writing out too because this it's the same thought pattern and i think the more we can make connections like this with the schools with the teachers that this journal helps every aspect of the child's education yeah. you know it's a good thing yeah i, I absolutely agree <laughs> with you jenny on just i want to uh, piggyback on several uh key points that you made um this uh, well, first of all, the juggling thing is really interesting because one of the big uh, neural um, uh, neuroplasticity studies that was done was this, there's this wonderful juggling study that was done where they taught people to juggle and they did fMRIs before, during, and after during that process, and they could see the parts of the brains involved in that getting bigger. Um, the and um, I, I I like what you are. Um, you are also um, talking about your 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 theater students um, practicing this, and you know, and and they get they get better at it. Um, 
it, your, your brain just responds to, to work. It's, it's repetition with effort. Whatever you do, you're, you give it repetition with effort and your brain will respond to that. But we have this really powerful pervasive myth of the genius in our society. So the, the, the myth of the genius is that there are these people who just are born with these natural innate talents and they're just so lucky to be John Lennon, right? And um, it's, and it's sort of like, it's magic, right? Um, but Serena Williams practices every day. Serena Williams has the coach who helps her look at what she's doing and refine it. And through that, she's becoming, she's become what, what she is. The same is true for Yo-Yo Ma. The same is true for uh, all these, these, but if you, if you kind of look at these people as they, like they're the gifted genius, oh, Serena Williams, you're so lucky to have that gift to be able to play um, tennis so well, she'd probably bonk you with her racket because it's, 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 she's got, she's got dedication. She's works at it and she works at it and she works at it and she works at it. And, um, and there's, uh, some of you may have heard of the 10,000 hour rule. Um, the idea is there's some research that was done on mastery of, 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 and this was looking at musicians and what it took to get these people to be, you know, like the first violin at the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. And they found in all these different cases, all these people that were sort of rising to a kind of high level of mastery in computer sciences, in, in, in music, in, in arts, in sports, all these different things. A bunch of these people, once they kind of put in 10,000 hours of work, they are kind of at this level that was, <clears throat> and so some people have looked at this and they thought, and they've misinterpreted this to suggest that in order to get good at something, you need to put in 10,000 hours of work. Because what a lot of people say is like, well, that's nice, but I frankly don't have 10,000 hours to spend on whatever this is. I've got the rest of my life. I'm living. You do not need to put in some 10,000 hours of work. In order to get yourself to the point where you're doing something and you're getting just a ton of positive feedback from it. I'm um, like, let's take drawing, for instance. You start drawing on a regular basis this year, Jenny, by this time next year, your friends are going to be turning to you again. They're going to say, Ginny, you're just so, you're just so blessed to have that gift, that, that talent. I wish I had it, but I just, I don't have it. Um, and my, here's my, my challenge for you, Ginny. So you said that drawing is something that you don't really feel comfortable with. If this year you throw yourself into it and 365 days from now, you turn around and you say to yourself, Jack was wrong. I, threw, I really put in the, the time. I did repetition with effort and it didn't happen. All right. Here's my promise to you. All right. You call me up. I'm easy to find. You go to johnmuirlaws.com website, contact me and say, hi, this is Ginny. Remember me from the chat. We talked one year ago and look, I've done all this work and it just, it hasn't crystallized. It hasn't, I, it, it, you were wrong right? What's going to happen? Here's my, my promise to you, Jenny. You will become my pet project, right? And I will give you personal free drawing classes until we can really kind of get this sorted out and you are up and rolling on your way because you will, you will be a neurological anomaly that will fascinate me. And I'm going to want to find out like <laughs> what is going on here and I'm going to learn something from it. Um, but I also know that this is a promise that I can easily make and not have to pay out on. <laughs> right? So I because promise I'll put the time in. You put uh, the time in, and, but, but Jenny, I'm, Jenny I'm, I'm serious. If you give this one year, it doesn't happen. You come back to me and I will be your personal private tutor we'll make zoom meetings. We'll do, if you're like down in, in if, if you're in the Bay area here, we can meet face to face um, or we can do this over zoom and we're going to, we're going to, we'll work on this together. <clears throat> um, but I also know that I don't have to, 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 to pay out on that because I know that if you do that, you're, you are going to develop this new skill and you're going to be, you're going to be delighted with what happens. I guarantee you, you are going to be delighted with what you see. 
Jack, I see Mark has his hand up. Oh, hey, Mark. Mark, where's Mark? Are you there, Mark? Unmute, Mark. No, he is unmuted. Might be the coffee break. <laughs> Um, while we're waiting for Mark, um, does anybody else have any questions, thoughts? Yes, NFS. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Nikki. Hi, uh, Nikki. So when you were talking about the person with the napkin, um, yes. when I was in law school, my notes were cartoons. Um, so like um, legal advertising, um, it had to be... Uh, I can't remember, but anyway, so I would have um, the airplane, <coughs> the couch look burn, use copper tone, followed by the air, um, airplane from the law offices. You know, you look burned, call the law offices of, and mm -hmm. that would be my notes. And whatever they lectured on, my notes, you know, um, would pick it up. And I was wondering, is that the same thing? No, it, it, it absolutely is. Actually, let me pull an interesting book uh, for you, Nikki, off my shelf. I'll be right back. Mark, are you there now? I am. I had my earphones plugged in because of my hearing difficulties, and uh, I just unplugged it. So uh, the, the sound level that I'm hearing is pretty low, so I might have to ask you to speak up. But... Um, a lot of things that you said really struck a chord. Um, I'm remembering many years ago, uh, going back to neurological issues, uh, I attended a, a lecture by Francis Crick, who talked about modeling the uh, neurological structure of the brain um, and comparing it to computer systems. So um, it was very detailed, and I can't remember a lot of the details uh, now. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't take good notes in those days, um, and I wasn't nature journaling. Uh, but my, my real question has to do with, uh, I missed the first couple of sessions on this. This is my, the first time I've attended uh, one of the sessions that Kelly has organized. And uh, I wanted to know uh, what kind of uh, notebook to use. Um, I keep notes typically when I go out and, uh, and do birding and, and scientific studies and things like that. Um, I... I find it very difficult to draw, especially in a small notebook, and uh, wondering what kind of notebooks and uh, writing instruments to use for that, that would, that would help me get through this. And by the way, I wanna thank Lynn for asking the question about photography, and your answer was right on, thank you. Well, well thank you, uh, thank you, Mark. So um, I'll answer your question, Mark, and I've got something to show Nikki, was it? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, welcome, welcome, Mark. Um, so, the there is no perfect set of tools, but there is going to be a set of tools that works for you at this time. Um, the most important thing I would say is the journal itself, and in terms of size, I'm going to suggest that you go as large as you would realistically bring with you on a regular basis. The, when it gets to be too big, you're gonna leave it at home. But the smaller it gets, what it does is it forces your brain to, it's harder to network ideas on the page. Um, if you are, um, if, you, if you just see a, um, if, if you just see a, you, you see something, you can get part of like the foot of a bird on this page. You turn the page, you can get its head. You turn the page. Um, like imagine you know, like writing war and peace. Like it was the best of times. Turn the page. Uh, it was the, you know, you actually need to kind of be able to flow. It's nice to have room to have an idea over here on one side of the page and another idea over here. And you realize that these are connected and you draw an arrow you circle this with a colored pencil and you draw it over to this and you circle that with a colored pencil and you start to, and then have room to have a diagram or a map of something. The more of these pieces that can splice together on an individual page, the more your brain will be integrative with them. Um, so I was in Turkey in a, a region called uh, Cappadocia 
and there are these very strange um, monoliths that um, stick out of the, the, the ground. So here's some, some sketches of these sort of strange geologic formations. They look like big mushroom caps. And for centuries, people have mined into these and created, um, created all these sort of chambers and rooms. And most of them, it's just completely abandoned. You know, these are, you know, medieval structures and um, you can just kind of go out into the hills and kind of crawl up and in, into them and around them. Well, my daughter and I um, were out sort of exploring around and we found, we found this, this, this one and um, what we did is we could, we could crawl in on our bellies when we had little flashlight and we crawled in on our bellies into this one and we kind of came into a, a central chamber and then that we could get into a, the next room from that and the next room from that. And so what we started to do was to, um, she did this in her journal too, was to map all these things together and um, how all the rooms interconnected. And then we made a sort of diagram of where those parts were kind of relative to each other on the big monolith. And we found this other special structure. We figured out it was for crushing grapes. And here is sort of side view diagrams of the grape crusher. Mm -hmm. Now, if I was doing this on a small notebook, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to kind of splice all those things together. And so having a larger page enabled me to kind of think more, I'm gonna have this kind of a map and this kind of a map and then tie that into, I want, I want to show kind of what this structure, you know, I, it was a lot more fun. But if your journal gets to be too big, you're not gonna bring it with you. Okay. Um, so as large as you'll realistically bring with you, I personally prefer ones with a sewn in binding because these journals can really take a beating out in the field. Um, and then for the specific media that you use, it's really a matter of personal choice. These days, I'm doing a lot of stuff with ballpoint pen. Um, and if you had met me a few years ago, it would have been primarily pencil. Um, I add color with watercolor, but watercolor has a big learning curve. And so I often suggest that people get a small set of colored pencils to initially kind of get themselves going. And... Um, and to, 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 to work it from there. Um, so there is no um, right perfect system. Um, I personally like toned paper journals because then I can add white as, a, um, as another uh, sort of positive shape and positive color. Um, it's fun to kind of, you know, put in those put in those, those, those whites. Also, I find that toned paper, there's a little bit less glare off the paper um, when you are out in a really bright, sunny place. I, was, I um, led a nature journaling safari in Tanzania, and uh, there was some intense sun because we're equatorial. And uh, mm -hmm. it was great to have a, a toned paper journal so that there is less, you can essentially get snow blind from from looking at your, your piece of paper. And that solved that. Um, so I, I would recommend um, a pencil, ballpoint pen, small set of colored pencils, maybe a, a find yourself a, a, if you like that look of that toned paper journal, get yourself a little toned paper journal. You don't have to worry about, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of different systems like the, Joseph Grinnell from UC Berkeley developed a system that, you know, does everything on lined um, binder paper that's this size with three holes in it. And they have a very elaborate system called the Grinnell method. Um, but f I'd say a lot of it's just personal choice. I would also recommend that you get a journal that feels good in your hand, that you as a naturalist, you like to pick this thing up. Um, if it feels like some sort of cheap thing and the pages are falling out and you kind of like, ah, I don't like this, you're not going to want to bring that around with you. But if you kind of like, uh, I like the feel of books. I like the smell of these things. And, and I 
So get one that a journal that feels good in your hand and you're going to want to bring it around with you. Well, thank you. Uh, you, you used the, the word color once in your explanation and I noticed that the, the drawings that you've been showing us are mostly uh, in earth tones, could I say that? Uh, not really bright colors. Uh, so that seems to be a feature of most of your journal work. Is, is that uh, something you would recommend also? Um, I, I would uh, probably a lot of these because I've got a toned paper journal. Um, you know, when I want something brighter or pink, I'm having to use kind of opaque gouache on that. Um, I, and I've got a brown journal that kind of gives me things that are more, are more earth toned. Um, but if I, um, I'd, I'd say it just sort of depends on, on what, on what feels like right for you. Um, I was thinking a little bit earlier this month, the next, my next journal, I'm going to go back to white paper. But actually, during the course of this meeting here, looking through some of my old brown journals, now we're doing stuff on gray-toned paper journals. I'm thinking like, no, I'm going to go back to brown ones. And so it's just, I'm fickle, and my, my preference changes. Um, but it is really fun to have some colors with you, because you, you're drawing a wildflower, and there's like, it's purple. <laughs> and that's fun. That's really fun. And you know, you could even, uh, even if you... You know, you can write in even just the title of it with, with purple, even if you didn't color it in purple. Um, or some people will just sort of make a little purple smudge by the side of um, what they're, they're looking at. And um, that shows like, like this part was this color, this part was this color. So you don't even have to color the whole thing in. It is nice to have uh, a range of colors with you. You don't need a million colors. If you try to bring like the huge, like, you know, 64 box of colors. Um, you're, uh, there's too many choices, too many choices. You want to kind of, you don't want to get choice for decision fatigue out there by trying to pick which pencil you want. You want to just have, you know, a small set with reasonable range of things. Maybe I like to have a few extra kind of muddy grays and browns and then a bunch of bright colors and, and then I'm good to go. So Jack, it's um, just after 11. I know you've already given us so much of your time and you probably, we would love to hear you all day, but I don't want to keep you if you need to go. So I don't know if you want to answer a couple more questions or- oh, I, you... I've, got a, I've got an answer for Nikki. Okay. Um, uh, and so Nikki, check this out. This is the sketch note handbook by Mike Rohde. And you got to check this book out. This was my, my, my recommended read for nature journalers um, for last year. I came across this book and went, whoa, this is what this person is doing with ideas um, is, you know, as this person sits in lectures, mm -hmm. this person is mapping together all of these ideas. Does that look like your notes? from back in the day um, and they've got sketch notes from all sorts of different people um, it is you know here's from a different person this person um, you know they are um, in this book I'll just kind of do the the flip through I have to kind of hold this up um, so they 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 go through examples of people's sketch notes and then in a very readable appropriate uh, approachable way give you ideas and strategies <clears throat> where they're kind of helping kind of break out the big ideas but then they kind of go into specifics of details that you can add on your page um, and so let's say you're watching a TED talk or a lecture or you're taking a course in natural history. You would take all your notes in this system that combines words and pictures. And um, they've got just examples from lots of different people's sketch notes. And um, it turns, I think that this is a much more effective, like, you know, they've got ideas for like, you want to make some quick cartoon people. Here are just some strategies of, you know, how you can make your, 
Um, and then, you know, here's a section they have on type and, you know, for how do you do, like you want to mess with some of your lettering? Well, here's some ways that you can do that. Um, and so it's, it's very, very accessible. I really, I really like this book, the sketch note handbook by Mike Rohde. Um, and if you, it sounds like you're already a sketch noter. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I remember what the word was. The, um, that the legal advertising had to be dignified. And so all of my cartoons were, were not. Like um, the bail bondsman's um, baseball jersey from the Bad News Bears, and I would have a law firm on it and say, is this dignified? Um, and I finished law school back in, in 1984. And the stuff I drew cartoons, I still remember. The thing where if you were out of state, you had to pay a higher fee for a hunting license in Montana. And so I had um, the car with the cow hooked onto it and two elk looking at it and saying, yep, they're from out of state. <laughs> and I had a professor after the final say to me, you must take meticulous notes. And I thought, oh, please don't ask to see them. <laughs> oh, no, but, but, but this, this, so, but what you're doing is you're activating um, you're written and visual together. That's exactly what Mike Rohde is talking about in the sketchnote handbook. And it's exactly what we're talking about um, here in this. It's not that one part of those brain, if your brain is, is, is better than the other, they're just, they're fundamentally different. And if you're using both of those together, beautiful things are going to happen. So Jack, that one last question. Um, Rosie in the chat is asking, how do we get students off their phones and engaging in more actual, real observations. Any tips for that? Um, it is, so the systems that we're now making, the apps for our phones, uh, for tablets, and the, the, the games and the social media platforms are intentionally designed by the people who are currently the cutting edge of human psychology to keep people there on those systems. They're only making money the more that we are just there and invested in them and using them. And that is really, has, has, has profound ramifications for you know, all of us with our, our developing minds. Um, realize that you are fighting against highly funded cutting edge research. Um, and I don't think there's one answer for getting us unplugged. Um, but I do think that nature is a big part of an answer to it. It is one, one part of that. Um, nature is, is amazing. It is infinitely complex. I find that when I get kids out into the field and, and into a creek or among the trees, nature still has, you know, these are kids who no normally they're just, they're all thumbs. Um, nature still can hook them, can pull them in. Um, for a lot of people these days, we also don't have, um, we don't have experience in what to do when you get out into nature. And if you look at movies, um, if somebody goes off into the woods, um, and first of all, they're crazy, and second of all, very bad things are gonna happen to them, right? <laughs> so um, it's not like, you know, they make this movie where the person goes off into nature and kind of starts writing poetry. No, it's gonna be like, um, hillbillies, mutant, mutant, hillbilly, aliens, you know, whatever it is, it's going to be bad. And even like the kind of documentary style things, Grizzly Man, um, Into the Wild. Um, there's still the same nature, uh, the same narrative about nature that it is, it's a threat. It's where you can prove yourself. It's where you're going to die in a horrible way and get eaten by a bear or starve to death. Um, and so survivor man, you know, guys, nature shows these days, it's, it's less like David Attenborough going, this 
chipmunk is the most astounding little creature. Look at how its cheeks come You know, it's, it's, it's some guy who carries a really big knife proving themselves themselves against nature, right? And that's, that's their challenge. It's, it's their, or, or that it's a, a place to have a big race. Like nature is a big stair master and it might eat you and it's dangerous. Um, so there are lots of forces keeping us away from nature. And part of it is it's, it's, it's us, the parents ourselves. Uh, we, um, we look at media and we see that uh, the news media is reporting all this, there's another child abduction, right? And so you think that child abduction must be on the rise. And it's not. It's not. But people think that their kids are only, it used to be like when my dad was a kid, he would get home from school and get on his horse with his 22 and go up into the hills and maybe uh, leave on Friday and be back, you know, a few days later. And his parents would go like, oh, great. Um, then my generation comes around and they let us, you know, run down to the park mm -hmm. and play. Um, and then uh, nowadays, even playing in your front yard is seen as a risk, right? Um, and that, that was pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but let, let's see. I'm going to take this computer. I'm going to turn it around here. And if you look out there, can you, can you see those two little girls out there? They're in my backyard. What are they doing? They're making mud pies. <laughs> They're making mud pies and mud horses and a mud pig. They're making mud sculptures and they've got mud like all over the patio and they're making their, but that's, that's pretty good. They came up with that on their own. And kids can still, the kids still have that ability. And nature kind of still has that pull if, if you let it. Um, nature journaling is part of an answer and part of response to that. Um, but in order to address that, we need actually a more, a higher level kind of sociological approach. I think that the person who addresses this the best and the most effectively is Richard Louvre. Um, if you have not read the book Last Child in the Woods and his subsequent book, The Nature Principle, you owe yourself a chance if you're kind of working in this, this field and really thinking about these things. Check out Last Child in the Woods and The Nature Principle. And he really spells out um, a very compelling case. And Nikki, you, you, um, it is, is it Nikki? Yeah. Okay. Well, Nikki, you'd appreciate this as, as a lawyer. He's evidence-based, right? So he's not just waving his hands and saying, nature is great. But he says, here's the data, right? Here is how being in nature affects your brain. Here is how it affects your health. Here's how it affects all these different sorts of things. And that is... Um, and, and then... Given that, what are the kind of society level things we need to change? What are the things on the personal level we need to change? What do we kind of need policy uh, level? What, what do we, how do we kind of, how can we affect this change? I think that he is probably one of the most effective um, thinkers on that. And I really want to point him, you folks, towards him. Um, also, you can go, they've got a very useful website called the Children in Nature Network. Go to the Children in Nature Network um, site and what the part of that that's my favorite is that what's called their research portal where um, you can go onto their research portal and um, type in what kind of category of thing you're interested in and they'll bring up all of the scientific papers and the abstracts for those and sometimes the full texts of those journal articles that relate to whatever idea it is that you're talking about so there's actually a lot of people who are researching this. And um, I think going in to, into it with sort of an evidence-based approach is going to be um, very, very helpful in getting results that will make a difference on a societal level. So nature journaling is part of the answer. Um, but we need to approach this from a lot more different directions. All right.
Thank you. Um, that was incredible. I, I didn't know it was going to turn into a nature journaling math lesson, philosophy lesson. It was all encompassing. Um, and I, I think, you know, I think each of us came out with something that we can take and use right away and also something that we can think about. So I think that's, that's really powerful. And I know, you know, a lot of us wear different hats. So I think we could see what we could use for ourselves and for the students we work with. So um, I, I know I have a, a lot to think about now. So um, thank you so much for your time. I, I know already some people are going to be following up. Um, I sent your email out and um, I'm sure you'll get some questions, but um, just thank you. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. And, and also just uh, in terms of, of kind of next steps and resources, um, I've just finished a book called How to Teach Nature Journaling. Um, and uh, they have just hit the, we, we've just got, uh, gotten the books in. It is in early and we're gonna be distributing those. You can order that book on my website. Um, I also have a book called The Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling. You can check that book out. Um, and it is, uh, if you were interested more in the like, you know, how do you draw a squirrel's tail? How do you draw a pile of rocks? What about water? Those sorts of questions. Um, and then um, Heyday Books uh, and my co-author Emily Ligren and I um, have released the full text of how to teach nature journaling for educators like yourselves um, for free to everyone in the world who wants to pick that up. Um, so you can uh, download that from my website um, as well as ordering the, 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 the full book. Um, there's a lot of resources out there to help you do this. I also, again, want to point people towards a Mike Rohde's sketch note handbook and Richard Love's Last Child in the Woods and the Nature Principle and all the resources that are there with Children and Nature Network. Thank you folks so much for what you are doing to connect people with the natural world. Our society really needs this right now. We as human beings need this. And um, being a bridge that helps other people access this is is so important right now um so thank you for what you are doing um during this time to uh, prepare yourself um to as much as you can to continue to 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 be in nature and we all have to work together as stewards to protect these natural places if people don't understand them don't respect them don't go to them or feel afraid of going to these places, there's not gonna be a constituency of people there standing to protect these resources. Um, so by helping educate people and showing them how to be in nature, like, oh, it's me with my journal here. Like, this is different than what I thought. There's no bear trying to eat me. Um, that makes these places accessible. It's gonna help us create a community of stewards who are going to go forward into the future and protect nature. Thank you guys so much for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, Take everyone. Care. We'll talk Bye. To Take you. care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Take care, Mark. Bye. You too. Yeah, thank you. Wow. So I'm going to jump off the call. If any of you want to stay and chat with each other, you're welcome to. Looks like. Yep. That's fine. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was amazing. It wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. That was really that was terrific. Great. Thank you. Uh, ha, ha, but it's kind of uncanny how much he looked like Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so when they make a movie about him, they'll have to have uh, Matt Damon. Stuff. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> no, he was amazing. Uh, uh, I loved it. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna sign off and uh, uh, good luck. See you next week. All right. Okay. See you next week. Okay. Bye. Okay. Everybody. Sharon, Mark, Mark, are you staying on? So what? I'll end and I'll leave this. Okay. And it's up to you guys. Okay.